Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Our next panel is all about climate change. What is happening to our planet? We'll hear from our panel speakers on the significance of global warming and the cause effects of climate change and what solutions can bring a better future. Joining us today is Patrick C. Taylor, PhD, climate research scientist at NASA Langley Research Center. And also, remember, don't hold back from asking your questions. Scan the QR on the screen below to submit your questions anytime during the panel. You will have the opportunity to connect with everyone and also the panelists in the breakout sessions. All right, thank you, Sterling, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Patrick Taylor, uh, climate scientist at NASA Langley Research Center. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you today. So uh, I, I have a, a set of slides that I'd like to uh, walk through today to really tell you the story uh, about uh, what NASA has been observing when it comes to climate change. And in particular, we have a very unique view of what climate change is looks like from space. So hopefully I can uh, share that with you today and pique some of your interest on that. So I've learned a number of things about both myself and about the world on my about 15 year journey through science. But one of the most important lessons that I've learned is that we live on an interconnected planet. You know, and I tried to highlight that here in my title. But what this means is that our actions affect the lives of others and the actions of others affect us. And so this may sound obvious to anybody familiar with the golden rule, but my epiphany really was with respect to our climate system is the way that our climate works, uh, it makes this effect operate at a global scale. So what this means is that our actions influence the lives of others, uh, those people that we will never meet, in fact. So I, I think if we can all internalize this concept and really understand it and implement it into our daily lives, we can make the world a better place just one small decision at a time. So I wanted to really demonstrate to you how interconnected our planet is. And I have uh, several kind of inter, uh, animations and graphics to do that. But if I only had to pick one, uh, this would be the one. You know, if this is an animation of what's Na called NASA's GEOS modeling system, and what you're looking at here are all of the many important parts of our atmosphere interacting together and connecting our entire planet. Whether it be here in the tan colors off the coast of Africa that are showing the Saharan dust particles that are being carried by the wind that are being lofted over the Atlantic Ocean and further towards the ES US East Coast, and also then further distributed throughout the globe where they can affect both the, the sunlight that reaches the surface as well well as the cloud properties uh, that or if you look at the mid latitude storm systems here which are denoted by those swirling cloud streams that you see that come across the United States uh, they're carrying air from both China to the US and air from US up into the Arctic so what this is just demonstrating is that our planet is connected and at NASA we collect data every day that illustrates this fact however I want to be, be honest is that I haven't always Throughout, uh, throughout my entire career in science, really appreciated the full consequences of these interactions. This is something that I've really came to learn and appreciate through my journey in science. So my journey in science uh, really began in the fourth grade. And this is when I vowed to become a meteorologist. And it was after a month long lesson on the weather uh, where in the corner of Mrs. Benner's classroom, uh, there was the digital readout monitor for the school's weather station. And I was, uh, actually given the role of chief data logger. So what that meant is that I went to the uh, weather station every day and I read the temperature, the dew point and the winds and I wrote it on the chalkboard. And then after that, we had a discussion throughout the class about what those numbers meant. <laughs> and from that, from that moment, I was hooked. I wanted to know what made the atmosphere tick. And my first love was clouds. As a child, I spent many summer afternoons watching them float by. Uh, but what I've come to learn throughout my journey in science is that those same clouds that just seem to be really pretty in the sky, uh, give me some nice shade on a summer afternoon are actually really critical to our climate system and have global impacts that I'll talk about a little bit more. But it's really, it's really amazing to think that, you know, that curiosity that was sparked in Mrs. Benner's fourth grade classroom, it really still drives me today. But there's more to it. You know, at that time, I had no idea that that curiosity for clouds and the weather would turn into a passion around such a societally relevant challenge, and that is understanding Earth's climate uh, and responding to climate change. You know, over the years, my questions that I'm asking as a scientist have expanded from what makes the winds blow <laughs> at this 
uh, elementary school weather station to what really uh, how how does our energy flow around our flow on our planet and how does that affect our ability to live the lives that we want and it turns out that nasa is really a great place to think about these global problems and sometimes even a climate scientist a cloud scientist can meet the get to meet the president so that was a really great honor and opportunity so it's really amazing to think that my journey to nasa started in an elementary school classroom in the fourth grade and i think a lot of us have similar type of stories so while it is curiosity that started me down this path it's the ability to do the most good for society that i would say that keeps me going that it's it's really empowering to to know that something i learned today and some observations that nasa takes today can save lives tomorrow and climate research really provides me this opportunity however as i alluded to earlier it's not something i always always appreciated as a graduate student at florida state university i knew that you know a five degree fahrenheit warming of the planet, which we're heading towards, uh, is a big deal and would have really big impacts on our climate system, affecting the temperatures and the rain patterns, the hurricanes, as well as the clouds. But at the time, I really didn't think any of those big changes would have any impact on me. However, there were some things that I was neglecting <laughs> when I was making those considerations. I, I hadn't really considered or thought about where the water I drank came from, or how the, the food I ate got to me, or how the energy I used was generated. I took all of those things for granted in graduate school. But when I finally sat down, started to think about it, it was after I was at NASA, after I, shortly after I started at NASA, you know, those systems that I just mentioned, the energy, food, water uh, systems that underpin our society, they're all vulnerable to climate and climate change. So for instance, you know, food and water availability are influenced by whether it rains, how much it rains, how hard it rains, and what the temperatures are outside, specifically the ranges, how hot it gets during the day. The amount of energy that we use to heat or cool our homes it directly depends on the weather outside. Well, our health, the health of the environment is all impacted by the range of temperatures and the quality of the air that we breathe. The, the food, energy, water, health, and security systems that underpin our society uh, and, in fact, influence the ability of NASA to accomplish our mission, all of these are vulnerable to climate change because climate change does impact our, our daily lives. And what this means is that skillful predictions of what the future holds have hold enormous societal benefit, both by both economically by saving dollars as well as saving lives. So here's just one example of a prediction that could have that that would hold and holds enormous societal value. Uh, but for instance, you know, thinking about this, knowing in advance that this summer would be exceptionally hot or exceptionally wet or dry, uh, this would help farmers plan and help city water managers plan to make sure that the water supply is sufficient for the community. Uh, knowing that there would be either more snowstorms in a given winter, or as this animation shows, more hurricanes or, or the intensity of those hurricanes in a given uh, summer and fall season would really help municipalities plan saving money and be more prepared saving lives. So better understanding of how our climate works, how our world works, our, our earth works, and the predictions of climate, these all can make our food, energy, water, economic, health, and security systems more secure and really important, more resilient. And data, this is NASA's bread and butter really, but data is an important part of understanding our climate and providing this data is one of the most important and impactful things I think NASA does. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But I wanted to take a step back quickly and kind of be clear and kind of provide you a few a few things about, about why I'm here today, what my internal motivations are for this. Uh, and first is, I, it's very important for us to communicate science in general, as well as specifically climate science, because as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it, aff it affects our everyday lives. Also, it's really critical that we build a climate literate society. So this is a society that is able to apply climate knowledge across all sectors. And this is really important because as climate change continues to intensify and the effects become more intense and broader, you know, no sector of our world is going to escape these changes, the, the climate changes and the impacts of those. And so no matter where, what your job is, you really have to understand how these changes could impact your, uh, your work, your job your livelihood. Also, I want to convey the important role that NASA plays, and in particular, the unique uh, 
our, our unique satellite data that really uh, we're, we're the only place on Earth to provide such a rich data set that, that is really key for understanding how our planet operates and then providing those societally relevant predictions I alluded to. Uh, I would hope to inspire you to learn more about nature and in particular how we interact with it. And then I really hope to inject hope back into the climate conversation. I know there's lots of conversations out there, lots of doom and gloom, uh, but you know, we, while the message is, the world is challenging, it's a challenge to respond to climate change for all reasons I'll talk about in a bit, you know, there is reason for hope. We can make a difference and we must. So as I mentioned, Data is a key part of making these skillful predictions that we need. The largest source of NASA data comes from these uh, our Earth observing fleet, which I have pictured here on the screen. So these satellites measure temperature in clouds, dust, sea level, sea ice, ice sheets, and that's just a few. We measure more than that, hurricanes and winds and uh, are, are also other things that we measure. But currently NASA operates more than 20 satellites and they focus on a lot of different science questions that are all important to our climate. And these are all aimed at understanding our planet for the benefit of all humankind. So one question you may have is, well, why do we need to have so many satellites? More than 20 is here, and this isn't really all of them. <laughs> uh, and so I like to think about uh, Earth's climate like a puzzle, and where the pieces are our atmosphere, ocean, plants, animals, ice, and of course, humans. We play a really key role in this system. And no single satellite mission or instrument is really able to, inter to address all these interconnected pieces. And so in order to get a full picture, we need many satellites to do the job. So, and from space, we've seen a lot of changes, particularly over the last 40 years. So what are those changes, which this represents a, the, the global surface temperature data. And this is a record that actually goes back to 1880. Uh, Global temperature is the most widely used indicator for our climate and climate change. And NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies is really the steward of this data set that you're looking at right now, uh, which is showing the changes in temperature in five-year averages from the beginning of the record through present day. Uh, and what this is showing is that the global average temperature has increased by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit over this time. And I can play this animation again for you uh, since 1880. Uh, and that's shown by the increasingly red color that spreads across the planet. But you know, more striking than that is that the 21 warmest years on record have all happened in the last 23 years. So all since 1998. So the way to think about that, uh, to put that into perspective is a 23 year old person and a 100 year old person have both lived through the 21 warmest years on record. That's really, really quite an astounding statistic to think about. You know, and a key aspect of, that you can see here as, as the animation uh, pauses is that, that not everywhere on the globe is actually warming equally. There are different areas of the planet that are being affected differently by these changes. Uh, in particular, if you look at the Arctic, you know, the Arctic has warmed about three times faster than the rest of the planet. And you can see that shown by this red cap that's on top of the planet. And you know, in the Arctic with all of that ice, you know, uh, a small change can make a really big difference. So a big change in the temperature of that region uh, can have really profound effects. And that is that is in fact what we're seeing. So as I said, NASA has seen climate change. One of the most, uh, one of the most iconic indicators of climate change is Arctic sea ice and routine monitoring from space of Arctic sea ice began in 1979. So the white areas you're looking at here in the animation are showing you the September sea ice extent that it happened in every year. Uh, the red line in front is showing you the integrated average in, in a unit of million square kilometers. So what the data show is that the last 14 years of Arctic sea ice have all been the lowest 14 years within the entire record. You know, overall, we've lost about 13% per decade of sea ice, Arctic sea ice, and that's equivalent to 3 million square kilometers, as you can see here. So to put that in perspective, that's equivalent roughly to the area of Alaska, Texas, California, and Montana combined. So and when you put that, when I put that statistic together, I didn't actually realize how big, I didn't appreciate how big Alaska really was. Alaska in, in land area is about three times the size of Texas. So the amount of sea ice that we've lost in the last 40 years is about four times, is more than four times the size of Texas in just the last few decades. So it's not just the sea ice that's changing. Land ice is changing well, and NASA really continues to monitor 
uh, all changes in our planet. But this is a particularly interesting one that has, again, global consequences. So this is an animation showing NASA's GRACE data. It's really, I think, one of the coolest missions that NASA does. And I don't have time to get into exactly how it works today, but uh, if, if you have, if you want to know, we can ask, we can get it there into the question and answer session. But you know what this data is showing is that Greenland ice sheet is losing, gaining a little bit of mass snow on its interior here by the light group, uh, light blue colors in the middle, but then is gaining is losing a lot of ice on its exterior uh, on the edges. And since May 2002, the Greenland ice sheet has lost an average of about 279 gigatons per year of ice. And that is the amount of water that can fill more than 140 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. And that's each year. So since 2002, this Greenland ice sheet, this loss, has accounted for about 25% of all of the global sea level rise that we've seen. And we also have that recent years have seen exceptionally big melts, in, including what I call out here is 2019. Just a few years ago, we had a summer that where it lost about 532 gigatons of ice, which you can see is about twice that average rate of, of ice loss that I alluded to. So you just take that one year and put that into perspective. You melt, take all that ice. That's enough ice loss, enough melt to raise global sea level by 1.5 millimeters, which may not seem like a lot, but if you take that same amount of water and put it over top of California, it would cover California in, in water about four feet deep. So <laughs> that would cover the heads of, of both of my eight and 10 year old daughters. So <laughs> it's quite a lot of water that to lose just in a single year. So I think it's important to remember what I've talked about so far is these average changes. You know, and average changes in our climate, average temperature, average rainfall aren't, aren't really things that we feel and experience. What we do live in is the day-to-day -day conditions, right? We live in events. We live in, and these events are encapsul encapsulate extreme events. So, so in addition to the average properties that I've talked about that are changing across our planet, the occurrence of extreme events are changing as well. And you can think about, you know, variability, highs and lows in our climate system a little bit like uh, the volatility of the stock market. We know in the long term, the stock market has generally trended up, but we have periods of both very high numbers and very low numbers as we go. And so it's that increasing frequency of those, the increasing volatility in our climate that we're, we're seeing a bit of. Uh, and this is borne out in this increasing frequency of extreme heat and extreme rate events that are shown here on these two plots that you're looking at. Uh, and so just to be clear, when I say extreme events, I mean abnormal weather. So these are the this is the events, these are the, the the weather that really sticks out in our mind that we remember, the stuff that we tell stories about and the events that we complain about. And so, you know, the upshot here, if you if you don't take away anything else from this slide, is really that, you know, as climate change keeps going, we're on a path where if you like to complain about weather or uh, you know extreme weather, you're going to have a lot more extreme weather <laughs> and more hot hazy conditions to complain about in the future. So, but these extreme events are actually hold a lot more importance for society than the average conditions. And that's because, you know, these extreme events determine really the economic and health impacts of the changes in, in heat extremes and the changes in extreme precipitation, flooding and drought that we're expecting. You know, since 1980, the cost of extreme weather events for just the U.S. has exceeded $1.1 trillion, that's a trillion with a T, uh, and counting. And temperature and precipitation extremes, what's shown in this map is that they've already become more intense, more frequent, and are longer duration. And so we've seen this across the entire United States. And a really interesting thing from a scientific perspective is that in the last decade, we've really advanced our understanding of these extreme events, how they're changing, and the conditions that bring them about. Uh, and that's really allowing us to have a lot more confidence about what we ex how we expect uh, these extreme events to change uh, as we go forward. So now we have a better ability to predict them than we did in the past. So this map here actually it indicates that. And so we are on this map. Well, sorry, uh, everybody is probably watching from different places, but the U.S. is definitely on this map. Uh, I'm here in Eastern North America, which is ENA on this map here uh, that you can pick out. And what this map shows is that you know in Western North America we we've seen very strong changes in extreme heat. But here in the eastern part of the country, we've seen very large changes in extreme precipitation events where now when it's raining, it tends to rain a little bit harder. 
So we've seen these changes, right? We've documented them, we've got data for them. But the key concept and key question is, so why is our environment changing like this? And why is it changing so fast? And this can be boiled down, maybe uh, some folks have remembered this from uh, elementary school and, and high school or science classes, but this is really, it's, it was being driven by what's called the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect uh, is caused by carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and water vapor in our atmosphere, as well as a few other uh, gases uh, in our atmosphere. And what they do, as shown in this animation, is they absorb energy. They keep it within our climate system. Uh, and, and because it's within our climate system, then it causes the surface to be warmer than it otherwise would have been. And that's what's shown in this animation. So scientists, we've understood this effect. We've known about it for uh, almost 200 years. It was first uh, identified by French physicist Joseph Foyer. And to be clear, this, this greenhouse effect is actually a really good thing. Without it, uh, the Earth's surface would be much colder, roughly about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's likely at that temperature, the entire Earth would be a snowball as <laughs> it covered with ice and snow, and that we wouldn't be here. So the greenhouse effect of our, of our atmosphere is actually a really important life-giving feature of our atmosphere. But it's also important to consider that it's extremely powerful. So water vapor and carbon dioxide, as I mentioned a second ago, are the two primary gases constituents in our atmosphere that provide this greenhouse effect. Uh, and if we increase either of them, it will actually help, uh, it will drive warming because it reduces the ability of the planet to cool to space and that causes the temperature to warm. So it's adding energy. It's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like when we uh, take water and want it to boil. What we do is we add energy to the bottom and of the pot and the water boils. So in a similar way, this greenhouse effect and the increased greenhouse effect from increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually adding energy, keeping it within our climate, driving the warming. So that's exactly, that's what's happening. And in particular, it's the human activities, uh, specifically the, the burning of coal, oil, natural gas, uh, that are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide pollution that's within the atmosphere causing it to warm. So one perspective I love, love to give you is that you know we humans, we've been on Earth for about 300,000 years. Uh, we've only been polluting like this, putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at, the, uh, at very, very fast rates for about the last 60 or so. So this carbon pollution uh, stays in the air for thousands of years. Uh, and it's what it's doing is creating a thickening blanket, a thickening greenhouse blanket, and that's trapping this energy in the atmosphere. The thickening blanket, then this extra heat, drives more heat waves, stronger hurricanes, bigger fires, more floods, and the extinction of thousands of species. But there is good news. To stop the pollution blanket and this overheating of our planet, we just need to stop polluting. So let me show you. NASA has some data about what this, this overheating uh, really looks like from space. So I'm a member of what's called the CERES, C-E-R-E-S, CERES Science Team. It, it, if you're interested, it, sound, it stands for the Clouds and Earth's Radiant Energy System. And as a member of that, what we've been doing is tracking Earth's, the flow of energy uh, throughout Earth's energy, throughout Earth's climate system. And we're the only group in the world that's maintaining this data and continuing this data record and tracking specifically how much energy is, is coming in and leaving the planet. So our observations have shown by this graph began in the year 2000. And what you can see here as the, both the yellow line, which shows the month to month values of energy and the red line, which shows the average changes, what you're seeing is the line keeps going up. And what that's showing is that our planet, our, our climate is accumulating and gaining more and more energy, more energy each year. Uh, so if our climate were not changing, this line would actually be flat. So, but what we observe here is this continuous increase in the amount of energy that's accumulating. So when you put more energy in to the climate system, it has to warm up. And what we've learned recently in a recent study is that this rate actually appears to be, be accelerating, which actually is not very good news. <laughs> but the good news is again, this is the, we can stop this accumulation of energy by stopping the addition of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This, what the curve that you're looking at right now is a direct consequence of that increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So with all of this increase uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the trajectory that we're currently on, we've been unable to really reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emissions on an annual basis. It's really important question to ask is what kind of, how will our, our future climate change and response and what does that mean for us? 
So to summarize, since I can't, you know, in, in this short time we have together, I can't talk about everything, but, you know, it seems there's no aspect of our climate system that's really left unaffected by climate change. You know, some of the most critical aspects of our climate that are changing include the rising temperatures, the declining sea ice, the land ice, uh, and the permafrost, rising sea levels. We're, we're experiencing more intense storms and hurricanes with flooding, droughts, and wildfires are all symptoms of the changing climate with enormous societal impacts. But there are a couple of key points I'd like you to kind of take away that are really important to consider. And, and one of those is that, you know, every ton of carbon pollution, every, every increment, every amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere, it's gonna drive additional warming. It's gonna drive additional climate change. That's gonna lead to additional climate impacts. So in this plot here, which I know is a little bit busy and technical, but what you can see is that these different uh, different color lines represent different scenarios. Each different scenario represents a different amount of carbon dioxide that's put into the atmosphere. And so these numbers at the end of the SSP uh, numbers in the middle of the screen here, if it has 1.9, that means it has a lower emission. Uh, so the lower the number, the lower amount of carbon dioxide emission, and vice versa, the higher the number, the more carbon dioxide that's being put into the atmosphere as you go forward. So what you can see here is as we add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we get much greater warming. Uh, and it follows this line pretty nicely, <laughs> in fact. So as we put this in, as, as more CO2 is added uh, in, in these higher emission scenarios. And essentially, a higher emission scenario means there's less uh, changes in how we use energy. And we're still burning as many fossil fuels as we did. So essentially, the difference between this SSP 5-8.5, where there's really high emission scenario, that means we essentially continue business as usual. Or some of these smaller emission scenarios uh, means that we make some changes to how we use energy uh, in our daily lives. So Again, the more CO2 emissions, the thicker the blanket, the larger the change. That's what's really shown here. And that every ton of carbon pollution that's added at drives more additional warming. Another really interesting thing to, to remember and think about is that, you know, I mentioned we've been polluting like this and putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as humans for about, you know, really just the last 60 years. But 50%, half of all of the carbon dioxide pollution that we've put in the atmosphere have actually all occurred since 1990. So it shouldn't be a surprise that some of these climate changes that we're seeing actually are accelerating really recently because, you know, for most of our lifetimes, for my lifetime, you know, half, more than half of the CO2 emissions that all of humankind has put into the atmosphere have occurred in my lifetime, which is kind of an amazing thing to think about. So uh, really another key aspect to consider is that, you know, we talk about these global warmings, but this global warming is just a way to kind of boil down all of our uh, thinking of climate change into a single number. But this all, all these changes have regional consequences. And the regional patterns and the regional consequences all scale with the amount of global warming. So for instance, if you have more global warming, which is indicated here uh, across these three plots. So this first plot on the left is showing you kind of one and a half degrees Celsius warming or three Fahrenheit roughly global warming. The middle plot is showing you the about uh, uh, four degrees Fahrenheit global warming. And the plot on the right is showing you about eight degrees Fahrenheit global warming. And what you see is that there are patterns across the entire planet where larger global warming equates to larger regional climate changes as well. Uh, one thing you notice in the top is that the land regions are ten, the places where we live, <laughs> so that's specifically critical, uh, are actually warming faster than the ocean region. So even though we say a, a global warming of three degrees Fahrenheit, that actually means that the land regions, places that we live, actually probably warm more like four degrees Fahrenheit or sometimes up to five degrees Fahrenheit. Another really important piece uh, to consider, especially for, for agriculture and human health, are the changes in precipitation and rainfall patterns that we're seeing. And as the planet warms, we're seeing all regions get wetter, but these differences between wet and dry regions are tending to intensify. And there are all kinds of stories uh, that will get worse about, uh, as we go move forward, about as, as dry regions experience more droughts, that will drive more kind of uh, mass migrations of people looking for food and water. And so these implications of these uh, intensified, uh, in, uh, intense, uh, stronger droughts 
and, and stronger flooding has really important consequences going forward. So again, a takeaway message here is that more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere yields more warming. Uh, and, and when you have more warming of our planet, we have more changes across the entire planet. So what this figure is, and I borrowed this from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their more recent, most recent report. This is an attempt to summarize all of the most impactful changes in our climate. So, because mean temperature and mean precipitation are actually only, you know, a couple of factors. And there are other, other things such as extremes that have much more relevant to our day-to-day our -day lives. So each bar in this chart, uh, represents a different aspect of our climate system that affects us. So we have, you know, wet and dry conditions. We have heat and cold conditions. Uh, we have wind, sea or snow and ice, as well as sea level and flooding, as well as changes in, in the ocean. And so we can break all these different factors up into uh, changes in, in landslides and acidity or hydrological drought, et cetera, uh, severe windstorms. And what you find is that you know the height of the, each of these individual bars that you're looking at represents the different the number of the different regions of our planet that will in the future with continued increase in carbon dioxide and continued climate change experience this specific climate impact. So, for instance, uh, the, the the maximum number of regions that can experience a uh, one of these climate impacts is 51. That's how the the globe was chopped up into pieces for this for this analysis. But what we see is that uh, all of the regions, <laughs> all 51 of the regions are expected to experience uh, more extreme heat, more hot and dry spells, whereas they're also ex most of them are expected to experience fewer cold spells and less frost. More than half of the planet is going to experience more heavy precipitation, as well as increased drought, and that leads to increased fire and fire weather in particular. Uh, now, considering the coastal regions in particular, uh, the coastal regions are going to experience more coastal flooding because as the ice sheets on the planet melt and as our oceans warm, uh, the oceans are expanding and they're filling up, leading to sea level rise, which is affecting uh, the, the, the really important coastal ecosystems and, and coastal communities that many of us live in. Uh, and this is going to lead to coastal flooding, damage to homes, infrastructure, uh, as well as erosion of our beaches. Uh, and this is going to be effect, uh, felt across the entire globe. Uh, so there really is, what's this graphic? One takeaway is that no region of our planet is going to be left unaffected by climate change. It really is going to affect us all. So I just take a, a short moment here to, to zoom in a little bit closer to home and show us a map of the U.S., well, North America. Uh, this graphic really shows that, that shows the expected warming from two different CO, uh, carbon dioxide scenarios. So on the top, you're looking at one where it has a lower emission scenario. So that essentially means it has that 4.5 number on it on the left side. And on the right side is a higher carbon dioxide emission scenario, 8.5. Again, the difference between these two scenarios are just our decisions as, as humans as to how much burning of fossil fuels and how we are going to generate our energy. Those decisions are what dictates the differences between these two uh, scenarios and maps that you're, that you're looking at here. So what we see is that um, by mid-century, by about 2050, we expect to see a warming of about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit on average across the U.S., but you can see certain regions are going to warm a little bit more than others. But, you know, sometimes, as I mentioned, we live in the day-to-day, -day, we live in extreme events, and, we, and we, we live in the conditions that we experience, which isn't the averages. So one way to think about this is, is if you think about over the, uh, ten, over the last 10 years, what is that most, the hottest, most sweltering, hazy, hot human conditions <laughs> that you've experienced. So the upshot of this is by 2050, those hazy, hot human conditions that we consider kind of unusual today, that we hope we only see for a few days and that those conditions break, those are going to be commonplace. So what that means is that we're going to have many fewer breaks between these conditions. And in, in some places, it's just going to become all the time, it's going to be much more unbearable. And in some places of the planet, uninhabitable for, for humans without, let's say, air conditioning, et cetera, which not everybody has access to across the globe. So if we look later in the century, which are shown by the bottom two maps here, we can see that there are, there's much larger warming and that you have much more warming when you have much higher CO2 emissions. 
So, but it's also important to remember, again, that these are just average changes and that we're finding that extreme temperatures, extreme precipitation over the US is projected to increase a lot more strongly, actually, which would have more uh, greater impacts. So to, um, to uh, sorry, I lost the slide, so I'll just quickly mention this. But to illustrate this, uh, this increase in, in heat extremes, you can consider what we one metric that we consider is the number of 90 degree Fahrenheit days, a uh, number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit that a specific locale experiences. And so the map that I wanted to show you is that the number of days of of these days are expected to increase. Uh, by mid-century across the entire U.S. by 20 to 40 days. So each summer, you're, we're expecting to, uh, for everybody to experience 20 to 40 more days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that sounds terrible, by the way, <laughs> personally. But you can look at some regions like Florida. That Florida is expected by mid-century to uh, experience 60 more days, up to 60 more days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So. On the other side of this, the number of days below freezing we're expecting to decrease. And so again, these changes in extremes that we're expecting uh, are, are more important to than average conditions to our built infrastructure, right? Our buildings, uh, our, our ports, our, our, our docks, our agriculture. These all, they affect the water quality. They affect our water availability. They affect human health, ecosystems, as well as the likelihood of disasters. So I wanted, I, I really like to, to do this when I have a chance, when I have some time, to provide this a tutorial, what I'll call, of how to think about the uh, increasing extreme weather events and why scientists are so confident in this increase that we're expecting. So at the beginning, and what you're seeing here is a, a distribution that's dancing around a little bit. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner is the year. And so this is the data showing you the distribution of temperatures that were observed over, the, over an entire year for each of these years and how it's changed in time. So at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, there was a lot of talk about flattening the curve, right? And this is the idea that if we slowed down the spread of uh, the disease, then fewer people would get infected and fewer people would die. So we'd save lives. So to understand this increase in climate-related extremes, it's also important, important to consider the curve, which I've already shown you here. But in this case, we're not flattening the curve really, but we're shifting it uh, here to the right. So I'll show you, run through this animation again. So what you're seeing here is our land temperatures from 1951 uh, through present from that NASA Goddard Institute of Space Studies climate data record that I, that I alluded to earlier. And what this curve is showing you again are average temperatures. And what you see are, are showing you the, the, not average temperature, but the, the uh, anomaly of temperatures. What you see here is that this midpoint this top of the curve, the average temperatures are really happening most of the time. But we have these small departures uh, from that average that gives us the cold and wet, uh, cold and warm extremes. So as a result of climate change, you see that this entire curve has shifted to the right. Uh, and what this means is that these, the amount of red on this plot and the amount of temperature extremes has become, uh, has increased quite a bit. And this curve is shifted away from extreme cold events. So this concept of shifting the curve can be applied to essentially all climate related disasters and events. So what this means is climate change doesn't cause extreme events. Extreme events, they've happened in the past and they'll continue to happen in the future. But the shifting of the curve because of the warming, what it does, what climate change is doing is it's making these extreme events today happen more frequently today than they did in the past and will make them happen more frequently in the future than they're happening today. And so this is opening up the possibility, as you can see, uh, for more extreme heat and larger climate impacts. Another way to think about this is thinking about rolling some dice. So if you roll any pair of fair dice, you know, you'll find that the number seven comes up most often, and that's because you know you have the most number of combinations that give you give you seven, and so seven can be thought of like average conditions, right? And so fair dice can represent uh, today's climate, where you seven comes up most often, and but then you get twelve and two come up. These cold and warm extremes come up every once in a while, but with lower probability. But in this metaphor, climate change represents weighting of those dice, so that the most frequently occurring number would actually be higher than seven. Right, so you can think of climate change as weighting the dice and are changing the odds of extreme events, in effect, making them more frequent. 
So, so small changes in our average and can make really big impacts on our extreme events. So to kind of dive into this a little bit deeper and to provide a little bit more context, you know, scientists have, have gone through the work to calculate the increased probability of these events. So how likely are they to occur going forward? So shown in this graphic here are the probability and the intensity of 10 year events and a 50 year events for each what we call global warming level. So today our present, as you can see here, present is one degree C. That's our current global warming level. A uh, level of global warming is one degree C. And as you get one degree Celsius, which again is roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. And as we go forward, you can see the changes in extreme events by looking at these number of dots. So starting on the, the left panel, uh, so first, I guess, the overall message here is that what we're seeing is that there's an increased likelihood and intensity of extreme events that's increasing with the amount of warming. So in the left panel, you can see that there are, are 10 dots, but only one of them is darkened. So this represents the probability of a what we call a 10-year event. That means you know, over a decade, on average, we'll see it once. So it's, it's a once-in-10-year type of, a, of extreme weather event. Uh, you know, and you could think of these as as hot extremes. It's kind of the easiest way to think about this. So, when we consider today's conditions, which are shown present, one degree Celsius, we see that these ten year events actually have become two point eight times, or almost three times more likely than they were at the before humans started putting all the CO two carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And also, these events have also gotten warmer, gotten hotter. And as we move forward in time, you know, as you track from the global warming level of one degree C to one and a half degree Celsius to two degrees Celsius to four, you can see that these one in 10 year events actually are becoming four times more likely at one and a half degree C and five point about six times more likely at two degrees C and almost almost 10 times more likely where that becomes the everyday kind of conditions uh, at four degrees Celsius of warming. So we can see exactly how the changes in, in warming are leading to more extreme events and happen, these conditions happening essentially all the time. So I'd also like to take a minute uh, to translate some of these effects into how they do affect our everyday lives in more tangible way than just talking about extreme conditions. Uh, and and because they will impact kind of, you know, our morning commute, for instance, especially where I live, and I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, so there's also one thing that is really important for us to consider that needs to be part of this conversation. And it's a, it's around this conversation of, of climate justice and environmental justice. But uh, it's that the risk of a climate impact affecting somebody is influenced by two factors. One, that's exposure. If you're if you're exposed to that specific climate event, but secondly, it's vulnerability. And not everybody and not every community has the same vulnerability. So again, our risk of influence of experienced climate impacts uh, are, are are depend upon our exposure and our vulnerability to this change. But climate risk varies widely within a single community even for instance we take my community hampton roads you know we all uh hampton roads virginia southeast virginia for those who don't know who where hampton roads is <laughs> but we we all essentially experience the same extreme heat conditions however within those community our community folks that have to work outside or folks that don't have access to air conditioning or reliable air conditioning they're going to have a greater vulnerability to that same uh, that same heat extreme event. And so that's going to make them at greater risk of climate impacts. So this is very important to consider when you're starting to assess the human impacts of climate change. So one thing that, that depending on where you live is more or less relevant to you, but where I live here in Southeast Virginia, we have a lot of what's called coastal flooding and nuisance flooding that occurs. Uh, and we have what we, you can see by this map on the right and this dashed red line is showing you this increase as you go from 1950 to 2010. Uh, so we've seen increased uh, what we call nuisance flooding or, or flooding the streets at just a regular high tide. And the data show that this type of flooding used to average about two days per year, but now is averaging more like 10 days per year by 2050. 
And the rainbow chart on the right is showing the projections as we move forward in time. And so if we focus on the, the green and light blue colors here, which are the most likely scenario that we expect to see for races in, uh, for increases in sea level, we see that by 2050, our region, instead of experiencing about 10 days of this type of high tide flooding, nuisance flooding every year, it's going to be more like 50 days. By the end of the century, by 2100, it's going to be more like 200 days. <laughs> so now, you know, this type of high tide flooding that floods the streets or certain streets within the city, essentially, you know, it floods uh, certain buildings, affecting the infrastructure, it closes roads. It's a bit of a nuisance, but it also has these long-term economic impacts. You know, right now, it might feel like more of a nuisance because it's something that we only deal with every other month. But when we have to uh, deal with it on a daily basis or at least a weekly basis, it's going to influence our ability to get to and from work and for, for people to get out shopping. And, and it's going to influence our, our, our buildings and the longevity of our buildings. It's going to have much greater impacts going forward. So another really big event uh, that kind of foresh that foreshadows a bit of what we're expecting going forward is the January 2020 um, uh, unprecedented Australian bushfires. And this is where Mother Nature really gave us a glimpse of what I think, what, what we're expecting in the future. So it started with a lightning strike. Then these fires grew into the most devastating wildfire season that Australia had ever seen. You know, the conditions that led up to this event included uh, a record-breaking, very low uh, rainfall and warm temperatures. These fires burn more than 19 million hectares, which is 46 million acres. And what you can see by this graphic from the World Wildlife Foundation is that it really outpaces the scale of any other <laughs> fire that we've seen in recent years. Now, the ultimate result of this fire was that it killed or displaced 3 billion animals. And these animal deaths and possible extinctions from this uh, were due to the destruction of the vegetation. And it, you know, in most cases, this vegetation is gonna either, it, it will never recover really. Some of it may recover in time over decades, but some of it will not. And so single rare intense events just like this, they can leave scars that never fade. Uh, and some of those scars in the vegetation and habitats can lead to extinctions. And we know that extinctions are, are irreversible. So these really big, irreversible impacts because of these extreme events. So closer to home, we in 2020, we here in the US and California had a really intense fire season as well. Uh, and it led to what was called their, their first gigafire, which was a fire, a single fire that burned more than 1 million acres. And this was called the August Complex Fire, if you want to Google it. But this whole fire season culminated in more than 4.1 million acres of California being burned. Um, and what you can see pictures here are pictures from NASA satellite images showing the smoke from the fire on October 1st and on September 26th, as well as in the bottom right here are showing the actual impacts and results of the burning of the fire. So in that bottom right corner, you can see that the shades of tan and brown show the severity of the burns from each fire. And so the darker shades reveal greater damage. So the dark brown colors, those are showing you where there's little or no vegetation left at all, whereas the tan colors uh, are showing you where it's significantly burned, but there is uh, some live vegetation. But most of these regions are actually covered now uh, with soot and ash and charred stumps and stems. And one other thing to really consider, uh, and there was a study done after these fires by the Stanford Center on Food Security and Environment, you know, the presence of fire and smoke is actually really poor for air quality, for us to breathe it. And they estimated that there were more than uh, 1,200, uh, that, that these fires and the poor air quality led to 1,200 excess deaths and estimated about 4,800 additional hospital visits that would have happened in their absence. So one other uh, event that I would like to quickly kind of go through to kind of show a, a, a kind of a breadth of, uh, of the impacts uh, is these are Landsat 8 images of the Brazilian drought that occurred last year and, and still lingering. And the picture on the left is from Lago das Brisas region and is showing in June 2019 uh, where the uh, before the drought and then the picture on the right showing June 2021 shows you where much lower uh, much much lower water levels that resulted from the drought and also a much browner landscape. <laughs> so 
in addition to obviously droughts lead to uh, reduced water availability, uh, but this drought here has in particularly hit the Brazilian coffee crop especially hard. And some of you who are really into coffee may have noticed this, uh, but coffee prices uh, have jumped by about 30%. And this is related to this 20 to 30 percent reduced yields out of Brazilian coffee, which Brazilian, uh, Brazil produces about one third of all the global coffee crop. And so a 30 percent reduction in that is a really big deal for global coffee and caused prices to jump. And so that happened at the at the grocery store. I'm sure you still saw that coffee drinkers. And also it's, it still seems to be lingering. So we've we've already seen this impact at our grocery store. So another really important and interconnected impact of this is that this region relies on the water levels for to generate hydrologic power hydroelectric power so water low water levels like this are actually contributing to energy shortages as well so the lesson from this is that our future climate is one with more frequent, stronger extreme events uh, that can inject additional disruptions and volatility in our, as we found out, already kind of fragile supply chains. <laughs> so, and this then could lead to prices prices rising further even. So the, the last thing I think that, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of quickly touch on the impacts of COVID on, on carbon emissions, because I'm sure folks have heard about this. Uh, and so there were some reductions in the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that are summarized in this plot here from the Global Carbon Project, uh, showing that during the lockdowns and the shutdowns that happened during COVID, there were, it was a reduction in the amount of carbon dioxide that was emitted into the atmosphere. And so, you know, the most notable change of the, the lockdowns and the reduced traffic on the highways was the cleaner air around the world. <laughs> there were pictures of this that you know, I'm sure you can still find on the internet. Uh, and so this was because of the reduction in the manufacturing and, and the fewer cars on the road. So we were putting less pollution into the atmosphere and so improving air quality. Uh, so associated with, with COVID, uh, carbon dioxide emissions were reduced uh, by about 5.6%. Uh, relative to to the year before, and so here again, this is information from the United Science Report uh, published in the World Meteorological Organization. World Meteorological Organization, excuse me. And this is great news, right? That carbon dioxide went down. But what I don't show here is that in subsequent years, last year and this year, we're we're already rebounding to go back up. You know, so this reduction in carbon dioxide emissions really has little effect on climate change as a whole, because in fact. Uh, during during 2020, the amount of CO2 within the atmosphere, the concentration, still went up. And so if you look on the right, you see the stack of bricks. And the stack of bricks represents the carbon dioxide emissions uh, for each year. So the height of those bricks illustrates uh, uh, this, this amount. And what you can see is you can hardly see the difference in this graphic between the height of those bricks. So even though 2020 was had a substantial decrease in emissions, 5.6%, there was still a substantial increase in the amount of CO2 that's accumulating in the atmosphere. So for this emissions drop that we saw in 2020 to really be meaningful, we need to do it every year at a similar level and keep going each year for decades, for decades to come. So personally, I wanted to touch on what what each of us can do. And I know I have a long list and I'm sure, you know, these slides, the, the, you, you can read this list later, but I just wanted to touch on a few higher level things as you kind of, I guess, read through these or look at them later. But there are a, a number of things that we can really do that, that maybe has even more impact than some of our personal actions, but I'll talk about those too. So first, you know, it's important to consider that money, our money, how we spend it is a lot like our vote. Right? This is how capitalism is set up. This is how our system is set up. So when you spend money, the way we spend money as a society really reinforces company behaviors. So, in, so what we can do is we can take that to, uh, we can, we can make uh, use that as our advantage essentially. And so if we start purchasing from uh, responsible companies that have sustainable practices, that have pledges and are, and are making strides towards net zero carbon dioxide, uh, and are limiting their emissions, that will reinforce those those decisions. And then they will make more products and will become more sustainable. Whereas the, the companies that are not uh, uh, espousing those practices, we don't spend our money that way. So it's kind of a way to give, it's so treating money like our vote and reinforcing the companies that are doing good, that are doing the way we want to see things. Also, 
we can actually vote. <laughs> vote, you know, money is our vote, but vote is our vote, right? So we can vote people into office who support climate change policies and are also uh, 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 support increased resilience to these changes and sustainability. As far as personal personal actions, we can opt into 100% renewable sources of electricity for your home. It costs a little bit more. I've done it. It costs a little bit more, but it's not it's not really anything that that's it's worth totally worth it. It's not actually anything you really notice. Uh, we can all travel less, um, and also change how we travel. Where sometimes we can link trips together, so we're you know doing more stuff in a single trip essentially consuming less reducing our waste uh composting and get uh either joining composting programs or composting on your own this helps reduce our food waste that we're sending to the landfill because when we send food to the landfill it actually has uh it decomposes less effectively and it can lead to more methane coming into the atmosphere versus carbon dioxide as these things uh as the, they decay so that can have a bigger uh impact and, and another thing i like to bring up is um uh, we can also take. Uh, uh, we can also reconsider every time we take some swag, right? Stuff we all get. You know, when you're going, in, when we're in person and you're taking something off of a table, uh, like a piece of paper or a pen or something like that, you know, you, we always think or, or have the tendency to think like, oh, they've already printed it, they've already paid for it, it's okay. Well, I'll just take that. It won't have anything, right? But it's really a reinforcing loop. So if you take it, they'll just make more. <laughs> so you know. Uh, just think about it is if you take one less, they'll print one less. So do I really need that piece? Or can I take a picture of that piece of paper? Or do I really need that pen to add to my collection of pens at home for that are 150 or something like that? So just some individual actions that we can think about as we move forward. So in closing, I think, you know, my purpose is to understand my purpose in my work and in my life is to understand climate. And I really care a lot about communicating how climate affects us and how our actions influence our climate. So, so that we can all kind of live better, higher quality lives. This is a mantra that I share with NASA and our work is for all of humankind. So what I challenge everybody listening is for all of us to learn more about the world that we live in and share that understanding with our neighbors communicating how food, energy, water systems, how they work and how they're in, impacted by climate shouldn't just be rest on the shoulders of scientists, but it's really all of our jobs, elected officials, policymakers, media, teachers, parents, it's everybody. So take this with you. We live on an interconnected planet, meaning that our actions affect the lives of others, the actions of others affect us. So the best piece of advice I can give really is to always consider and follow the golden rule. You know, the interconnectedness of our climate means that our actions affect the lives of people that we'll never meet. If we all internalize this concept, I think we can make the world a better place one small decision at a time. And every day, NASA data provides more illustrations of just how interconnected our planet is. So these data are vital to helping scientists solve the most pressing scientific challenges and to help society thrive on our changing and interconnected planet. So with that, I, I thank you for, for listening and uh, I uh, hope hope you can provide us some questions. But what I like to do here is I have a colleague of mine that's with me here today to join on the panel to help us answer some of these your questions. Uh, Dr. Yolanda Shea or Yolanda is my office mate uh, in, in normal times when we <laughs> when we're all at uh, at NASA together in person. Uh, and she's a climate scientist like me and focuses uh, on generating some data. And I'd like to turn it over to her to provide a couple of comments and, and a little bit of her background. Thanks. Thanks, Patrick, and very nice presentation. Um, I, I certainly enjoyed it, and I hope everyone else did as well. Um, so as Patrick mentioned, my name is Yolanda Shea, and um, I have enjoyed uh, the lunches that Patrick and I have been able to eat re more recently as we've been <laughs> going back into the office. But um, so I support a project called Clario Pathfinder. I'm actually the project scientist with a science lead for this project. Honestly, the Acronym Clario is a little long, convoluted, and doesn't tell you much about what the mission does. So I'm just going to explain what Clario Pathfinder is. Um, so this will be an instrument that will be on the International Space Station. We have a launch date for next December, which is very exciting. We've been working on this for several years. Um, but from the International Space Station, we'll take measurements of Earth, of sunlight reflected by Earth. And um, there's several novel things about that, the instrument, the measurements that it will provide. But first I wanna talk a little bit about um, 
reflected sunlight. So Patrick talked quite a bit about how the earth is like a puzzle. I also think of the earth system as a puzzle. So I love that you brought that up. But um, the earth system really is a puzzle and um, you kind of need the right tools to tease the pieces of that puzzle apart and really understand what's going on in the Earth's climate system. Um, Patrick also talked about the 20 plus satellites that are orbiting Earth and taking all sorts of different kinds of measurements. We use different, different pieces of information, different um, pieces to the story uh, to get a better understanding of what's going on with Earth's climate. Reflected light is one of them. Um, and so we'll be taking measurements of some of that reflected light. From reflected light, we can learn um, several of the, the animations that Patrick showed um, were generated by satellites that are sensitive to reflected light. Um, our eyes are sensitive to reflective, reflected light. We can design satellite instruments that act similarly to our eyes or that can see more radiation or more reflected light than what our eyes can even discern. Um, and then we can taking that information and how we know things like cloud properties or the land surface reflects light, we can kind of back out some of the physical information that is within the story of that light that's carried back to the satellite at the top of the atmosphere. Um, so the, uh, the light from that this instrument that Clario Pathfinder will measure from the space station, I kind of like to think of it as um, uh, the analogy of, of a television, right? So some of our earliest satellite instruments back in the 60s, 70s, um, you can kind of think of them providing a view of Earth like an old black and white television. <laughs> um, they're kind of grainy, you know, you're just getting really black and white images just like how much light is being reflected by Earth, but not really a sense of the different wavelengths, amount of um, uh, information in different wavelengths or like you can think of them like colors. Um, whereas clearly a Pathfinder measurements will provide more of like a 4K high def um, image or uh, visual of Earth. Um, we'll be able to get quite a bit more information. And the one of the most poignant things about this instrument is it will provide an unprecedented level of accuracy. Um, so again, trying to can you imagine watching like a, a football game on one of those old black and white televisions? You're trying really hard to see, okay, so where's the football and how far has it traveled? It'll be it's a lot easier to see on the TVs we have now, right? Um, it's it's a similar thing with the the improvement that Clario Pathfinder measurements will provide. Um, as Patrick mentioned, there's a lot there are a lot of things <laughs> changing about the Earth's climate system as we continue to pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and as the climate changes, we wanna make sure that we have a good pulse on that. We wanna make sure that we have clear glasses to see exactly what's going on. Um, and in turn, that information can be used to help policymakers figure out, hey, what kind of, um, what kind of response, if anything, should we be having um, to the changes that we're seeing? Um, so those changes, um, even though they're you know widespread, we're seeing some pretty poignant changes like the increased wildfires, the increased high uh, degree days. Um, we uh, also want to make sure that we have the sensitivity of our instruments, make sure that they are accurate enough to see what actually kind of looks like small changes. But of course, those small changes can have pretty significant impacts, right, as Patrick mentioned. Um, so Clario Pathfinder will be providing that. Um, and the other thing that we'll be doing, another great thing that Patrick mentioned, right, it's a whole story, a complicated story, the Earth system. And one instrument can't do it all. So as wonderful as I think that our instrument that we're developing for this mission um, will be, um, we can't do it on, all on our own. Um, we will have this unprecedented, not achieved before level of accuracy. Well, we also have a few capabilities that allow us to improve how accurate other instruments that are also taking measurements of reflected sunlight, how accurate their measurements are. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the golden rule thing. We're kind of sharing the, the wealth of our high accuracy with other really um, uh, state of the art um, instruments as well. So as project scientist, I am I am leading the science efforts on this team, um, making sure that the folks on my team have what they need to, and you know, make sure that this project is successful. And so far, so good. I think so far we're we're doing a great job. Um, I've been at NASA Langley for about ten years. I got my PhD ten years ago. Um, 
little bit about my journey. I also started with an interest in weather and clouds. Um, and I was really afraid of thunderstorms. So I watched the Weather Channel all the time to see, hey, what's going on? Um, is there going to be a tornado? Not a ton of tornadoes in central Virginia, but still, I wanted to know what was happening. And um, that kind of spawned an interest in the this idea of the Earth system as a puzzle and how we put different pieces of that puzzle together to put together a story like um, a forecast, a weather forecast, or a better understanding of our Earth's climate system. Um, so uh, that's just a snapshot of, of what I do and, um, and how that contributes to some of the things that Patrick shared with you, um, did a very nice job of sharing with you. And I hear we have some questions that Patrick and I would be happy to help answer. It's the question, there's a theory that climate change is cyclical around a pattern that would be uh, correctly uh, correct total in a few years. So this is a question that that I do in, uh, get a lot. I'll, I'll take this one, Yolanda, you can jump in at the end. I, I get this one a lot. And it is true that we have these cyclical patterns in our in our climate system that we have periods of warm and cold that have happened over, you know, glacial interglacial periods over very long time, time horizons. Uh, but what's happening, what we're doing right now to our planet is, is essentially unprecedented. The rates of increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are much faster, <laughs> order of magnitude faster than anything that has happened uh, happened naturally, right? So we don't have any, uh, any analogs from the past that really directly, uh, directly influence uh, or directly inform us about what, how the Earth will respond to carbon dioxide changes that that we're seeing right now, uh, because the, naturally the, the changes have never happened this fast. Uh, it's true also that uh, three million years ago, the carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere actually were about the same level as they are today. Uh, but and at that time, the the globe was about three degrees Celsius or so uh, warmer. Than that, and what we know is that our ocean actually delays the changes, <laughs> or makes the change. The uh, I want to say this: it makes a lag. It delays the changes in the climate in response to carbon dioxide. And so, it's what what the long-term record where these cyclical changes happen are uh, telling us that actually maybe we haven't even gotten to the point where we should be, <laughs> based upon the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. So that. As far as the rate of the changes, the the analogy I like to use is kind of like, um, and why the 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 rate at which we're kind of pushing it, um, uh, it scares me a little bit. It's because so I was a 16 year old one time, and I drove my car really fast. And you never know how a car is going to respond when you kind of hit the gas pedal and get it going up to 100 miles an hour. But that kind of <laughs> feels like what we're doing with our climate right now, because we're pushing that that uh, carbon dioxide increases so quickly and so rapidly that we're overwhelming any sort of natural cycle that might actually be there. So, um, so will these patterns that that we know exist in our climate um, kind of correct climate change? The answer to that is no. Yeah, I think you did a nice job with that. That's the, that's the main thing. Yes, our climate has changed in the past and similarly to how it's changing now, but not on the timescales that it is changing now. We're really um, pushing the pedal down uh, quite a bit and increasing the speed much more than it has in the past. I think we have one more question. Okay, so what areas can high school students look at to study in this area? And are there any NASA programs that they can join? Um, always excited to hear about this because I had these questions when I was a high school student. And I don't think I, I quite took advantage of the resources that were available to me. So um, there are a couple of things that you can do to even get involved. Um, so we have some citizen science programs, um, uh, most notably NASA Globe. Um, you can you can just Google NASA Globe, and I'm sure it'll take you to the website. But I think uh, observer.globe.gov will also take you to quite a bit of information about how you can kind of get involved with starting to take your own measurements that contribute as well to the NASA mission, just like Patrick and I are working on um, instruments that contribute to the NASA mission and to that collection of measurements. Um, there are high, uh, high school programs available. Um, 
and uh, you can always go to intern.nasa.gov and take a look there. There's lots of stuff for college students, but there are some things for high school students as well. If you're specifically interested in earth science, there's the Virginia Earth System Science Scholars. Um, that's pretty exciting. I believe what they do in that program is um, uh, you, you kind of come to this area, to Hampton Roads, or close to where Patrick and I live. Um, you get to interact with scientists, and you also get some experience in thinking about what's involved in developing an earth science mission, kind of like what Patrick and I work on. There's a lot that goes into it, a lot more than you might think. Uh, Patrick, can you think of anything else that I may have missed? Yeah, I, I would just highlight the intern opportunities. There's also volunteer opportunities, um, but I would, but I know like um, uh, my wife actually also works at NASA, and she's had several high school interns work with her team. And so, you know, intern, we have interns at internships at NASA at all levels, high school, undergrad, and graduate school. So all of those are a possibility. Um, in particular, is like what areas you might want to study. So what's actually kind of maybe overwhelming and also cool about Earth system science, about climate, is that really you can study any area like in undergrad, in your undergraduate degree, and then get into get into a master's or a PhD in like climate uh, because I have I have friends from graduate school that had uh, undergraduate degrees in mathematics, um, in physics, in chemistry, um, engineering. So all of these, uh, you know, essentially, when you think of climate and and meteorology uh, or sciences, you know, any of those sciences give you the tools that you need really to to learn and and be. Um, and and to be successful in the career and also i guess i should mention computer science coding and computers is a really big uh big area of our field you know all those a lot of the data that i showed you some of those outputs comes from well thousands or even millions of lines of computer code kind of end up doing that analysis and all of our weather prediction models are just essentially computer codes that are solving mathematical equations and mm -hmm. that's what gives us our, our climate and weather prediction so you know a good background in studying math physics uh, and understanding you know how to get around a computer will all be really helpful if you want to pursue a career in kind of earth and climate science Absolutely. or any career at nasa actually i would say that's true we should mention um, maybe just one last thing is that um, even if you're not, I know this is STEM City USA, I know if you're not specifically interested in science, technology, engineering, or math, but, um, but you're interested in supporting STEM efforts, we also need people who help us tell our stories, we need lawyers, we need people who help us manage um, our funding. There are other ways to contribute to the NASA mission as well, and you still get to be a part of, of, of helping us get to space, helping us better understand Earth, um, and, and that's another way to serve as well. So also keep that in mind, but for, to what Patrick said, definitely get a good foundation in your math and your physics and in and, and, and learning computer science, um, some of those skills, and you'll have a good foundation to kind of take you anywhere you want to go. I think that uh, I think that ends our session for today. Uh, I think Yolanda and I can be in that uh, virtual room uh, here for, for about 10 minutes or so if anyone wants to come say hi to us. That's right. Wow. After this, join us in the breakout room to connect with the speakers and other attendees. Also, we'll see you right back here at 1 p.m. for our next panel discussion, HBCUs Fighting Climate Change to Save Our Planet.